the great events of this conference <clears throat> has brought back to my remembrance an experience of last December. One of the attending physicians of my open heart surgery of a few months ago asked if I would participate with him on a Sunday school program. I followed him at the pulpit. He gave a tremendous address. As he took his seat, I felt prompted to say, because I felt it, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that this man has touched my heart very deeply. <laughs> the great messages of our presidency, President Kimball, his counselors, these of the 12 and others have touched me deeply. I have done reminiscing and remembering at this great historic conference. My mind goes back just a week ago where I was privileged to attend a state conference in Oregon. And lo and behold, in the audience was my very first bishop, a man of great faith and capacity. I hadn't known a bishop until I was 15 years old, and when I moved to Hollywood, California, this was my first and great experience. He stood then, as he does now, over six feet tall, well over 200 pounds, and a heart to match. And he has never let go since. I remember under his tutelage, memorizing this little verse. Remember, Paul, he said, there's an odd little voice always speaking within, and it prompts you to duty, and it warns you from sin. And what is most strange, it makes itself heard, though it gives not a sound and says never a word. You follow it. And last week he said, are you still following it? I remember a great wise teacher who said, Paul, always keep in mind <clears throat> that a strong man and a waterfall always channel their own path and a dad who said, I gave you a great name. Remember, a good name is better than a girdle of gold. I think every boy and young lady ought to have in his life a great dad, a marvelous bishop, wonderful teachers. Many do, some don't. Thank God for a prophet, for leaders of the church, like you, who add that kind of dimension. I thought of another great man in my life, a coach, who has affected my life for eternity. And I'm pleased to announce that he and I are engaged in learning more fully the gospel of Jesus Christ together in a missionary effort. I'll never forget the day I walked into his office, scared to death as 15-year-olds are, trying to sign up for a varsity team. I stood outside of his door for the better part of five minutes, and then when I got the courage, I knocked timidly. The voice said, come in. I opened the door and walked in. He said, what can I do for you, son? I said, where do you sign up for varsity baseball? He said, let me ask you a question. You want to play ball or be a champion? I said, I came to play ball. Oh, he said, I'm sorry, we're all filled up. With a broken heart, I turned and walked out. And that wasn't the answer I wanted to hear. I stood in the aisle for a minute. Thank goodness for great courage from a dad to keep trying. I girded up my courage and again knocked on the door. The answer came as before, come in. I walked in. He said, oh, it's you again. And I said, yes, sir. Maybe you didn't understand my earlier question. I asked you, where do you sign up for varsity baseball? He said, I ask you a question. You want to play ball or be a champion? Well, I knew the other answer didn't work. <laughs> so I said, oh, I want to be a champion. Oh, he said, sign here. And I did. He said, we build champions. I signed up. He turned and he said, have you ever signed a contract? I said, no, sir, I'm only 15. He said, at this institution, we commit ourselves to principles. 
he took from the bottom drawer of his file a contract already typed. And on it were the standards that we've been listening to in this great conference. He said, you take that home and read it over with your parents, and if you can agree to the conditions, you sign it and bring it back tomorrow. I did. Somehow I made the team. In the contractual agreement were promises to be the kind of a Latter-day Saint I knew I ought to be. We went through a great, great season, ended in a tie with our arch rival high school. The playoff game was to determine the state championship. As we assembled on the field in the last minute preparation for the great event, the coach had us around the batting cage. And as he was making his little pep talk, he stopped in front of me and he said, oh, by the way, you'll pitch the deciding game. My heart dropped. He continued his counsel. And then he stopped in front of our excellent second baseman. Most of you would know him because he went on to play for the Chicago White Sox for a number of years. He said as he looked, and again, Jimmy, is that a nicotine stain on your finger? And Jimmy, like the rest of us, had made a commitment to keep his body clean. Jimmy, looking at his finger, quickly hit his hand and said embarrassingly, yes, sir. He said uh, in front of the whole team, did you sign a contract with me? Yes, sir. And you broke the contract? Yes, sir. Do you know, would you turn in your uniform? You're through. And I want to say, coach, tomorrow is the big game. He was batting 385 and hadn't made an error at second base all year. But he was thinking of a boy not of a game. Jimmy turned in his uniform. The coach kept close to him. I drew the assignment the next day to pitch against Al Yalian, who later signed with the New York Yankees for a fabulous bonus. Thirteen innings we went, and he beat me in the thirteenth, one to nothing. And the run came when a ground ball was hit to second, where Jimmy normally played. The ball got through a nervous substitute's legs onto the outfield grass and eventually scored an unknown run, which defeated us. Now, 30 years later, I thank God for a great coach who taught me that principles are more important than games. I reflected upon that and others. Quite often, young people ask those of us in these positions, why do we hold so many meetings in the church? The Lord understood and answered. I refer to the 43rd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord speaking to you and me, young people, through a prophet says, And now behold, I give unto you a commandment that when you are assembled together, ye shall instruct and edify each other. Why? That ye may know how to act and direct my church. And I thank God in this great conference and others that have proceeded for learning how to act. Earlier we sang, we thank the O God for a prophet to guide us in these latter days. I'm constantly with you before many who are not of our faith. And the challenge is great and wonderful. Not long ago I was given a little honor before a great group of non-Latter-day Saint athletes. And in the proceedings of the convention, one of my great idols, the Hall of Famer, was to take the rostrum and speak to us. Being the great athlete that he was, respected by many, a former idol of mine, <clears throat> I was shocked to hear his language and in the process to repeatedly take the name of the Lord in vain. And as I sat there, I wondered, what do you do as a Latter-day Saint in these kind of social situations? And then I remembered the counsel from a prophet. The experience that he had one time coming out of surgery, sick as I'm sure he was and felt, a boy was wheeling him back to his hospital room on a little metal cart and caught his hand between the door and the cart in the elevator. And not thinking 
let go with a few adjectives, and in the process took the name of the Lord in vain. And a sick prophet in his physical form, but very well spiritually, lifted his head and said, Please, don't talk that way. That's my best friend. Those thoughts went through my mind as I listened to my idol. And as he concluded, he sat down and I put my hand on his knee and I said to him, You're terrific. Did you know when I was growing up as a little boy, I had you on a high pedestal? But if I might level with you tonight, tonight you fell off. He said, Didn't you like my workshop? I said, I loved it. But every time you opened your mouth, you offended me and a lot of people out there. And I'm going to challenge you tonight as your friend to clean up your language. I thought of the Apostle Paul and Joseph Smith and particularly of a prophet today, Spencer Kimball. And I learned on that occasion, as I have many others, that people really want what you and I have if we have the courage to give it. God grant us to have that courage and determination as we go forth to be an example into the world. I pray as I testify to these truths that I too know God lives, Jesus is the Christ, and here sits his prophet in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.